Good morning, Sugarloaf Online family. We're so glad you decided to join us this morning. Let's sing this out and have some fun. When night has fallen, when fear is calming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. Come on. When my mind says I'm not Decided I'm not giving up Cause you won't give up on me You won't give up on me Your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Every season, you keep repeating promises to me. Now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete. When my mind says I'm not good enough, oh, you're enough for me. You're always enough for me. Yeah. I've decided.
I'm Lynn Dale and I make a difference. Not that my parents didn't do a great job of explaining, you know, why everything was important. It was somebody else that cared about me that wasn't related to me, right? That says, um, you know, you matter to God and, and this is where you need to be. If you're there every Sunday, they, they take so much away from that and you really do develop a bond. It's fun. It really is fun. It, it, you see it. You just see the growth. You see them um, engage. And, Welcome to Sugarloaf United Methodist Church. My name is Jen Kennerly, and I am thrilled that you're worshiping with us today. Specifically today, because we're celebrating the excellent reopening of our campus ministry environments. Our adult worship experience is open, our award-winning preschool is open, and this past week, we reopened student ministry. Our teens were finally able to gather together for fellowship, worship, and discipleship with their peers and small group leaders. Now, we set our sights towards reopening our children's ministry environment on October 18th. Our kids and families are beyond ready. We have a mission to raise up the next generation of kids to know Jesus as Lord and develop his character. Do you wanna be part of it? Good, because it takes a lot of people to raise the next generation. We have a dream to add 25 people to our team. We have positions working with kids as small group leaders and independent of kids on our guest services team. This is your chance. Together, we can make a difference that spans generations. Before we move to our worship service, we want to remind you that we have a new way to stay connected and in the know about all things Sugarloaf with the QR code. You will need to install the app from the App Store. Our QR code will take you directly to the Sugarloaf What's Happening page. Using this code will become a mainstay of connectivity for us in worship each week. And now, as we worship God with our giving, we thank you for your extraordinary generosity. Because of you, people in our community and church will realize that they matter to us and to God. We invite you to give to expand the kingdom of God on earth and through our community with the ministry of Sugarloaf. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we worship you. We praise you and we thank you for your presence in our life. We are so thrilled that we are now able to gather together in person again. Lord, use the gifts that we bring, this act of worship, Lord, multiply them, help them to accomplish everything that you want us to do as a church in this community and in the world. Lord, I thank you that when we give, you promise us that all of our needs will be met in you. You are the giver of every good gift. Lord, help us to be good stewards of the tithes that we bring into Sugarloaf. And Lord, I just thank you that our people will be so blessed. Lord, bless them in every area of their life. We ask all these things in your name we pray. Amen. Now would you continue to worship with us?
One of the joys in worship for me is always those Sundays when we have a moment of Holy Communion. And at Sugarloaf, we practice Holy Communion on the first Sunday of the month. And so today, we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion together. And so I hope that you've had a chance to prepare some elements, but if not, I'd invite you just to take a moment to uh, kind of hit the pause button and go and, and get a cracker or a bagel or a croissant or a loaf of bread of something and, and then some juice so that at the very end of our time together today, we can meet with Christ. We can ask for forgiveness. Together we can commune with God through the bread and through the juice. And so I'd invite you to prepare. Hey, we've been in a series called Short Stories. We're, we're in the New Testament. We're looking through the Gospels. We're finding these moments where Jesus would tell a story to point to understanding the kingdom. And so I pray during this series that your mind is being renewed as you're thinking about who God is and how the economy of the kingdom of heaven works. I pray that you're feeling your heart enlightened um, as we're thinking about these stories that Jesus is telling. Because every time Jesus tells a parable or a short story, he's always trying to get us to leave the kingdom of this world and to think about the kingdom of heaven or think about the character of God. Or sometimes he's even disclosing something about himself. Now today, Jesus is going to tell a story. Just a, it is such a short story. He's going to tell a story about prayer. Now, the interesting thing about Jesus is, now think about it, God on the planet in the flesh. He's experienced prayer from both sides. He knows what it's like to pray on the earth and to be feeling that distance and that removal from heaven. And yet he knows what it's like to receive prayers in heaven. So he's able to, to, to give us a perspective about prayer from both sides. Now, before I dive into Jesus' story, let me just mention real quickly my experience with prayer because I bet it's a lot like your experience. You know, I've been a Christian for a good little while. I've been a student of prayer for a long time. I know the power of prayer. I know the results of prayer. I know they're undeniable. And I think for any Christ follower, they would say they know the power and the importance of prayer. But I also think that any Christ follower would also say, and boy, my prayer life, boy, it's been through ups and downs. I've had moments where it was hot and moments where it was cold. Moment, moments where I was consistent in my prayer life and moments where I was just taking, a, it seemed like a long break from the prayer life that I really want. But I can tell you across all these years, I, I look back on my prayer life and it's through prayer. It's through talking with my father that I've drawn so much strength or, or peace when I needed it. I've gotten guidance, I've, I've received instruction. And I think one of the most important things that happens in prayer is we're syncing up with the Father. We're, we're praying and we're having a moment for time with our Heavenly Father, His children meeting with Him. And what often comes out of those prayers are answers, answered prayer. I'm so thankful for answered prayer, and, and, I, and, and I think you probably know what I mean, sometimes unanswered prayer, when we're not really praying for the best of things. Well, Jesus tells a short story about prayer. Now, the Bible is filled, and especially from Jesus' teachings about prayer, he wants us to know about prayer, but this is just one moment where Jesus is going to teach you about prayer, and we've got to get this lesson through this story. So I'm going to pick up with you. If you've got your Bible, your tablet, I invite you to read along with me. In Luke chapter 18, we're going to read the story of what's become known as the parable of the persistent widow or the unjust judge. So beginning in Luke 18, reading in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, 
I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, for this story, uh, like many stories, Jesus has a couple of characters who are going to interact with one another. And the first character in the story is a judge. Now, Jesus gives us a description of this judge. This judge uh, has no respect, has really no regard for God. He's not a religious person at all. As a matter of fact, he has no regard for people. Now, that's going to make for a pretty callous judge. I think if you've ever went in front of a judge, you wanted them to be a person who cared about people and who knew about mercy. Well, this one, this, this, this character in Jesus' story, he's got none of that. As a matter of fact, as far as you can tell, this judge only cares about himself. As a matter of fact, later on in the story, Jesus will call him an unjust judge. Apathetic towards God, apathetic towards people, that's who he is. Now, also in the same town, we get this other character. It's a widow. Now, you've got to see and think about why Jesus would describe this widow in a town. A, a widow was a woman. And women oftentimes in that culture had had so much less respect and authority and power than men did. But on top of that, even, even beyond that, a widow, if, if there was someone that could be trampled over, that could be treated unjustly and nobody really be none the worser for it, it was a widow. And so this widow, it's very clear. Something has happened. We don't know what it is. Something has happened and she's been treated unjustly by somebody. She even calls them, you remember her, her adversary. Did you get that? And so the idea here is that this widow keeps coming to this judge. And so she keeps coming over and over and over again. Now, in order to get this picture, you got to think about what it would be like to keep going to court. Have you ever been to court before? I have. Court can be a scary place, right? I mean, you're anxious, you're a little fearful, you don't know what's going to happen. And, and that's one of the things I love about the story I mean, Jesus puts us in a situation where we don't know what's going to happen. And, and, and what could be a stress-filled situation in a courtroom, right? This woman, this widow, she keeps coming. She keeps coming. She comes over and over again to the court every day. She will not let this go. She knows something was done to her that was not right. And so as she comes, she comes every time she comes with the same plea over and over again. Grant me justice against my adversary. As if to say, what was done to me is not right. And you're the only person that I can come to. Would you please grant me justice? She keeps going to the same person over and over again. She won't stop. Now, in the Bible, uh, there's one line that I really love. Right after it says, when she says, Grant me justice against my adversary. The Bible says, for some time he refused. Those three words, for some time. We are meant to see this as an elongated period of time where she came and over and over and over again. And maybe what was going on in the mind and in the attitude of this judge who had no regard for God, no regard for people. I mean, can't you just imagine it for a minute? I mean, at first he's just ignoring this woman. Who is she? Why does she keep bothering and interrupting my court? And, it, and I'm sure for some time he dismissed her. Dismissed her today and dismissed her, I'll dismiss her tomorrow. He's dismissing her over and over again. You're not even on the court calendar. I don't want to hear from you. It moves, I'm sure, into probably some level of annoyance that she's coming every day back to him. He's bothered by it. And I have to wonder at some point if he didn't start thinking about why does she keep coming and start maybe even listening to the merits of her plea. But at some point, I love that phrase in the Bible. It says, for some time he refused, but finally. 
But finally, but finally the, the judge uh, said to himself, listen, I, I don't care about God. I don't care about people. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. It's really for this kind of bad judge. He's only interested in himself, right? And so he finally gives her justice because she kept coming, kept coming over and over again and wouldn't stop. There's so much more to this story that I want us to pull out of it. But let me just pause for a few minutes and just share with you what I consider to be four big ideas in this very, very small short story. And the first one is this. It's, it's, the, it's, it's probably the most obvious of all, right? Why does this widow's request finally get granted? It's not on the merits of it. It's not even really about the case itself. It's not about what the adversary did. Why is her request granted? Well, the answer out of the gate is persistence. She would not quit. When it came to her request, she got up every morning, she headed, she knew that he was the person who could resolve it, and she would not quit. Now we know that Jesus is teaching about prayer, right? It reminds me of that other place where Jesus said, ask and you will receive. You know, Jesus is telling us, when you ask, you're going to receive. Remember that one place he said, knock, knock and the door will be open. I think in this moment, what Jesus is giving us a picture of is when it comes to our prayer life, we need to knock and knock, and knock, knock, knock. And we need to keep knocking on the door and learn something from this widow that our prayers, there's an element of our prayer life that just needs to be persistent. Keep on praying. Don't give up. Learn from this widow and her story. A second big idea that I would hope you would hold on to is just the idea of who this judge is. You know, in most of Jesus' short stories, when we begin to read it, we think through some, some modes of symbolism. I mean, if, is, is this that, and how does this represent that? And that's a normal thing to do. There's many of Jesus' sto short stories use allegory, right? But in this short story, I want to be very mindful with you. This judge does not represent God. I mean, that's very clear, right? He has no, no regard for God, no regard for people. So how can we perceive who this judge is and how he might relate to the kingdom of heaven or, or, or our heavenly father? See, what Jesus is doing here, rabbis, uh, Jewish rabbis call an understanding of the light and the heavy. So he's contrasting. It's, it's a lesson in contrast. He's giving us a picture of an unjust judge who is also not compassionate, right? He doesn't care about, God doesn't care about people. All right, that's who he is. Versus the heavy, right? The light versus the heavy. What Jesus is doing is saying, listen, if this judge would grant her request because she was persistent and he didn't even care about God and he's, he, he's not got a lot of ethical bones in his body and at the same time, he's, he doesn't care about people. If that's who he is, imagine this significant, massive contrast with your heavenly father who is much different than that. He is compassionate. He was always righteous. He pursues justice. If this happened with him, imagine how it might happen with God. You see, this is what we need to understand about this judge, that he is a major contrast to our Heavenly Father. Third big idea with you for a minute. The third big idea is that sometimes uh, we get from this story just the understanding that prayers are delayed. At least the answers to our prayers are delayed. Now, I don't know why that happens. It probably happens for a lot of different reasons, for a lot of different prayer requests. But what I do know about prayer, let me just talk to you about prayer for a minute. What I do know about prayer is that a delay is not necessarily a denial. Sometimes God delays in answering our prayers. And those delays can happen for a lot of different reasons. Man, I look back on my prayer life and I think sometimes God was saying to me, not yet, and for many different reasons. Just God has a lot of reasons for his not yet. 
One of those reasons is I think sometimes God is testing us and say, are you going to trust me to meet that need? So I'm asking God for this or that. Am I going to go out and run and do it for myself? God's testing me. Will you trust me to answer your prayer? So sometimes there's a, there's a testing going on and he wants to have us come to him and persist and lean in to trust. I look at sometimes in, in the other ways I've prayed and, and God was saying not yet so I could change my prayer. Uh, that, that happens to me routinely as a pastor, guys. I will ask people, uh, I will be praying for people and then I'll actually get with them eyeball to eyeball and I'll, I'll just say, hey, listen, how can I pray for you? And I will have already been praying for them and then they will tell me, hey, listen, here's how we're praying. And it looks different. It's a variant from what I've been praying. And I look at them and I say, listen, I will start agreeing with your prayers. I'm modifying my prayers and for lots of reasons. Across all the years I've been a Christian, boy, I've, I've seen a prayer that I was praying become modified because I got new understanding or I went to a new place in my life. Why does God delay? Why are there sometimes and not yet? Lots of reasons. Sometimes it's just for our own development. Sometimes it's just so that we can grow and push forward. So I don't know why that sometimes uh, answers to prayer are delayed, but I do know, listen now, I do know that a delay is not necessarily a denial. We're supposed to keep praying. And then fourth big idea with you real quickly, and you got to get this because this is a big one. When Jesus finished his story, he asked three big questions. We need to live into and hold on and wrestle with these three big questions. They're the heart, really, of what he's after here. I mean, can you imagine sitting in Jesus' presence? He tells a story, and at the end of the story, he looks at the crowd who's sitting there, and he asks some questions. Don't you think those questions are very important? So what's the first question that he asks? When he finishes his story, the Bible says, he says, uh, Jesus' words, he says, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Here's the first question. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? See, that's question number one. It's as if he's saying, this is that judge. And God is so very, very different from him. God is vastly more compassionate, more just and more righteous. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen children who are crying out to him day and night? You remember last week I told you that whenever you read scripture, you always need to look behind and ahead to see what's going on. You know, Jesus tells this story. Here's the context. He's just been teaching about how the world seems to be falling apart, how there's injustice in the world. He even talks about the generation that are living right then and how they're turning away from God. He talks about whether faith would be found in this generation. He talks to them about what God wants to happen. It reminds me, literally, of our world right now. I mean, we live in a broken world, right? I mean, it seems like sometimes our world is just spinning out of control. And Jesus, in that moment, as he's talking to them about the generation and the world and the struggle and the unrest and the, and the injustice, it's in that context he tells a story. And then after the story is over, he looks at them and he says, listen, will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who are crying out to him day and night? It's as if he's saying, listen, if you're praying for this generation and for this world, if you're on your knees, listen, I want to tell you, Listen, will not God, you don't think God hears you? He hears you. Will he not bring justice for you? And then the second question he asked right on the heels of that, he says, will he keep putting them off? He answers both those questions right after it. He says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So what Jesus is saying is, listen, God hears your prayers. And he will respond to your prayers. Don't give up. And then Jesus asks a third question. Come on, listen to this church. A third question. And it begins with the word, however. Jesus says these words. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? 
whenever you get that word, however, it, it's a moment for Jesus just to kind of move beyond the tyranny of the urgent, what he's been talking about, and actually go to something bigger and something more broad. Jesus is saying, listen, he's talking about the generation, the world going on then. He's talking about people praying right now, but Jesus presses out and he says, however, maybe more importantly, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus doesn't know when his second coming is going to be. It's not been revealed to him. It, it says only the Father knows when Jesus is second coming. But Jesus knows that we live in a world that is a sinful, fallen world is only going to keep deteriorating. And Jesus is basically saying, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to God's chosen ones, the, the, the followers of Christ, the children of God, will they give up? Or will they stay faithful? Or will they keep praying? So that even however long it takes for the Son of Man to come back and however fallen apart our world might be, that there will be chosen ones who have learned this short story and they say, I will not give up. I will keep crying out for God's justice and God's mercy. What he's saying is keep praying and don't lose faith. At the very beginning of this parable, Jesus made a statement. Uh, actually, the, the, Luke made a statement. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. That's the heartbeat of what Jesus is teaching. And it's even the heartbeat of his questions there at the end that you would always pray and that you would not give up. When you hear that word, not give up, I, I want you to hear it a little differently. Don't lose heart. Don't, don't, don't lose faith. Don't get discouraged. Don't throw in the towel. When you've prayed and prayed and prayed, I mean, you don't even know how to pray anymore. Or, or, or when you start to think, maybe, maybe my prayers are just hitting a concrete ceiling and coming back. I just don't know that God's hearing. Jesus is saying, don't get discouraged. God hears your prayers and he's going to respond to your prayers. This is who he is. He's a lot different from that judge. You keep praying. You don't lose heart. So, you know, I would ask you on this day where we're going to celebrate communion in just a few moments, I would ask you two big questions. And the first one is this, is there something on your heart today? I mean, is there a place where you just want to go to your father and say, God, here it is. This is something I really need to talk with you about. This is something that's just, it's in my world. It's heavy on my mind. Lord, I want to just present this to you. You see, your heavenly father wants to hear your prayer requests. He's brought you this story today so that you would lift up whatever is on your heart. What's on your heart today? Lift that up and pray about that thing today. And the second question I would ask you is this. Is there a prayer somewhere back, it littered in the past, that you were praying and you were praying, you were lifting up, you were asking God for, but somehow the not yet's just, they weighed your heart down. And somewhere, somehow, you got discouraged and you just gave up on it. And my, my, my question for you is, if you looked back into your past, and maybe even by the power of the Holy Spirit, He brought to your mind right now a prayer that was important to you, that you prayed for a long time, but you've finally given up on, and you lost heart on. Is there a prayer that you need to go back and pick up? Is there a prayer you used to pray? It's a very important prayer, but because you experienced a few not yets, you just dropped it. Listen, the power of the good news in the gospel and God's love for you is that you can go back and you can pick up that prayer and you can bring it back to the Father. He will remember that prayer. And according to Jesus, it won't be a not yet forever. He's going to answer. There will be an answer somewhere. Why don't you go back and pick up that prayer today? I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, maybe he just quickened your mind about a prayer that you can bring back to him. We're going to celebrate Holy Communion in the next few minutes, but I want to give you time right now to lift up those prayers to God. And instead of me praying for you, I'm just going to pray here for the things that I need to pray for. And we're just going to kind of create a, a quiet place for you to lift up your prayers with God. Hey, would you pray with me?
God, I thank you that you hear our prayers. And God, I know so many times because we live in this world, we can get discouraged. And it can feel like our prayers just hit a concrete ceiling and come back. But God, remind us that we need to think, we need to understand, and we need to believe in your word, which gives us a picture vastly different from those feelings that can sometimes keep us discouraged and not praying. Oh God, thank you for this good story today that Jesus gave to us as a reminder that we should keep coming to the Father. And Lord Jesus, I know that's what you did. You just, every day the disciples saw you coming back, meeting with the Father. Lord, help us even this week to be a people of prayer who are just coming to you over and over. It's just, it's the most natural, winsome thing for us to do. We are going to our Father because you hear us and you minister to us and you guide us and you, you, and you, you pour into us when we give you our prayers. Thank you. Oh, thank you for this word today. Lord, help us to be a people who will always pray and who will not give up. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and agree. Amen. Well, I hope you took time to get those elements. Uh, let me re just remind you of, of, of this moment and what we believe about this moment. When Jesus was about to give his life for the world, he met with his best of friends and he took what was there, bread at the table, and he transformed it. And since that time, bread and the juice at the table, they have been used by church and Christians to enter into a communion time with God, to, to spend time with Christ, to ask for forgiveness, and to be set free and to put back on mission. So the bread that's there, and I'd invite you to take whatever bread you have with you. Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he explained to them how his body would be broken for them. At the moment, they didn't understand it, but they would see his body broken in just the next 24 hours. Jesus' body broken and sacrificed for you and your forgiveness. And then he took the cup that was at the table. He prayed a prayer of blessing over it like he did over the, the bread. And then he passed that cup around the room and he told them to take and drink and he explained that his blood would be poured out for a new covenant. He explained a covenant of mercy and grace. And so we thank Jesus for his blood. It washes away our sin. It covers over all our unrighteousness. And so the next few minutes, as you receive and minister to one another, there, wherever you are, the body and the blood, the bread and the juice, and you remember Christ's sacrifice, may you experience the atonement the atoning of your sins, the, the washing over of your sins and Christ making you new. Would you pray with me? God, in the next few minutes, may this bread and this juice and wherever we are celebrating this together, may your presence be known and may you make this bread and this juice for us representative of the body and the blood of Christ poured out for us and for our salvation. Renew us, forgive us, cleanse us, we pray. And Lord, raise us up to the newness of life resurrect us through your resurrection. And Lord, set our feet back on solid ground, back to do your mission and ministry in the world. Lord, meet with us now. Heal us, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. If you will, take the bread where you are there and just break a piece off. And in giving it to the other person, say to them these words, the body of Christ broken for you and dip it in the cup that is there with these same words, the blood of Christ for your forgiveness. Take a few moments now and receive communion together.
I want to thank you for joining us for worship. And my prayer for you is this week that this would be a week filled with you talking with God. Why don't you make one of your goals this week just to knock and knock? Remember what it said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find, knock, 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 and the door will be open to you. Church, let's pray. Let's continue to pray and let's bring our needs, our thoughts, our worries, our cares, our requests before our Father. Surely He will hear us and He will act justly and quickly. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hey, would you share this benediction with me now? And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God bless you, Sugarloaf. Have an awesome week.